The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Welcome into episode 14 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week's guest is JP Gaster of the legendary rock band Clutch. Had a lot of fun chatting with JP. He is a fellow native of Maryland, so we have a shared affinity for DC Go-Go and gear. He's also uh, my, my personal favorite rock drummer. Is able to combine um, that kind of post-hardcore edginess with just classic big beat feel. His gear always sounds great. His snare drum is one of my favorite sounds. Bass drums are always a legendary sound. Uh, and he just loves drums, so we had a good time for the next hour here just talking shop about being in a band for 30 years and how that works and what gear he's going to take on the road and what gear he's taking into the studio. I also um, got super nerdy and asked him about some of the drums he used on Clutch Records, which he happened to have in his rehearsal space. So let's get to it. JP Gaster. First question, since I know of you guys as being just such road dogs over the years and you're gearing up for a little bit of a tour, how's that feel? Uh, exciting, uh, slightly daunting, uh, maybe a little nerve wracking. Um, <laughs> I'm furiously working out now and doing push-ups and doing all the things that I should have been doing for months. I started yeah. the yesterday, you know? <laughs> yeah. So like the road chops, right? They go away after a while. They sure do. Yeah. And, and that's, that's going to be a challenge. I, I'm, you know, the thing is even, even when we get together and we play and we rehearse and we write, nothing can prepare you for that thing that happens when you get on stage, mm. that shot of adrenaline, just, pumps you up, the crowd is out there, and you immediately just start playing way too, way too fast, way too hard. You know, I, I, I tell people sometimes, you know, for me, I spend, I spend a good portion of the night up there just telling myself, just calm down, just be a normal person. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to jump around, you don't have to smash this ride symbol again like you did in the last chorus, you know. Just calm the F down, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have any, um, I mean, gosh, and that's when you guys were on the road all the time. So do you have any like on the gig, you know, what do you do? Breathing, stretching before the gig? What do you, what do you do to, cause I, I, same thing. My arms would get pumped and I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm done. It's like, good luck for the next hour. Uh, I, I spend, when we're out on the road, I actually spend a lot of time practicing, um, at least on the pad and when, wherever possible, I'll take a little practice kit with me. And usually you know, we usually sound check around four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. Um, shortly after that, we'll have some kind of a dinner and then um, and then I'll start shedding. And that can be whatever, whatever I'm into at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll and I'll do that right up until showtime. Sometimes I'll take a break and check out whoever's opening and get, you know, get some of that music and um, then go back to my broom closet or back of the truck or, you know, parking lot, wherever I have found my little place for that day. And um I just, I just keep shedding, just working on whatever it is that I'm trying to do. And, and so by that time, you know, by the time showtime comes around, I'm, I'm usually pretty warmed up, mm -hmm. you know, but still you get up there and no matter what you do or what you tell yourself, it's always, it's exciting, man. I mean, we're playing rock and roll. There's a bunch of screaming people out there and people are drinking beers and having a good time. And, you know, I, I want to be there too. I'm, I'm, I'm part of that. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. So have you guys played any in the past year? We did some streaming gigs uh, right out of out of where we're we're at right now. This is uh -huh. this is our uh, jam room. This is our rehearsal room. We write in here. We record demos. Um, and when the pandemic hit, um, we kind of went into sort of damage control mode. You know, we mm -hmm. had a lot of touring lined up, uh, and we had to think very quickly: what do we need to do in order to not all have to get jobs at Home Depot? Mm -hmm. So uh, we figured out how to stream a show, and that's something that we had never done before. Um, and we started with just a, a laptop right in that corner behind where my drums are. Uh, Neil set up his laptop there, and we had our sound man come down, so we had good sound. Um, but the first show was just literally done right on a laptop computer. Um, 
and it was live. All the, all the all the shows that we streamed from here, we, we did three in total. Uh, we're going to do a fourth one eventually, some point this year. Um, they're all live. It's the real thing. We get we get in here and just freak out, and what happens happens. Do you uh, archive it, or is it just if you catch it live, that's it? Yeah, well, we yeah we we have it archived. We also, um, you know, we we did some merch bundles with with. Uh, uh, with these things where you could buy a ticket for the show and get a t-shirt recording of the show. We would, we would record each night and um, and have it mixed and then press those up on vinyl. And so it's kind of a little bit of a souvenir. Was, yeah, the idea was to really make it feel a little bit more like a show and not just some dudes playing on a, on a computer screen. And so we tried to make it a little bit of a, an event. So each one had its own uh, artwork, its own t-shirt, its own ad mats. And... Um, we did different things too with the set list. On um, one time, we had we had the fans pick the set list. Uh, another time, we we took songs that were sort of the most popular of all the fan songs. Um, so we we tried to do different things and just try to make each one unique. Uh, try to play a different set each time, and so that that kind of kept us on our toes uh, mm -hmm. in in those really you know in those, in those dark times. It was it was pretty crummy. Were you guys getting together? otherwise regularly to or just taking a break uh, no we did we, we got together pretty regularly we we got together and we we, we started writing last year for a, a new record um and so in between these these shows we would just write riffs and record everything um but i gotta tell you all the stuff that we did last year we ended up scrapping entirely and started from scratch this year wow how come um material just wasn't where we needed it to be you know and, and i mm. think there's a lot of factors going on you know I've, you know of course it, it wasn't a very inspiring time mm -hmm. uh, I, I know you know a lot of people uh came out of it with this feeling that they were able to you know explore some new creative ground and 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 I'm, that's good that they did um it, for us it was more just kind of damage control what, what do we need to do to continue this thing. I mean, we all have families and mortgages and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we were in a position that, that we could do something and, and that was play shows. So it worked out, it worked out pretty well. Um, this year with, you know, with the good news of the vaccines and now we have shows on the, on the horizon, much, much easier time for us as far as being creative and writing. And uh, this year has actually been really good for that so far. So do you guys work out ideas on the road? Is that how it gets going? Absolutely. We, we, uh, we work stuff out on the road. We work stuff out here sometimes and then take it on the road. Um, that step of the, the creative process to us is essential. Uh, we'll, we'll come up with, with an arrangement that we think is a pretty solid working arrangement. And then we take it out and test it live right away. And man, you can tell immediately if when that song is where it needs to be. Is, is, is the tempo the right place? You, you'll find out in the, in the first half of the verse, you'll know. Uh, is the chorus where it needs to be? You're gonna know by the second time you hit the chorus. If you got a good chorus, people will be singing along to what they think the words are, you know? Mm. But, um, but then you know, okay, we're on to something there. And, and so it's, it's really a laboratory for us. And, and we've always done that since the very beginning. And, and I think the fans to some degree have, they've sort of learned to expect that from us. Mm. Uh, our, our fans are really great. They let us get away with a lot of stuff, <laughs> including punishing, punishing them with new riffs that they hadn't heard before. Um, but it's essential for us. So, so we get out there and we learn so much about the song and then come back here, maybe rearrange it, tweak it in one way or another. And, and that process continues right up until we go to the studio. Uh, th this year has been really challenging because we haven't had that 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 sort of give and take that 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 part that, of the process that for us is so important. Um, so for that reason, we're very much looking forward to getting back out there in November, in December or September. And yeah, if anyone's going to check out a clutch show, you're probably going to hear some new material that's in the works, right? <laughs> so, how often? Does a song go like get completely reworked after you play it live, or is it just minor tweaks? Uh, most everything will get at least a minor tweak. Uh, some stuff just just gets cut. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we are at uh, for this new album now. We've got fourteen songs, so we're we're ready to ready to make some cuts. You know, <laughs> we tell the song, you know, thank you for coming out. You're you're, wel you're welcome to try again next year. But. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> do you tell the crowd that you're doing something new or you just sneak it into the set? Um, these days we just do it. And, and part of the reason is because, uh, you know, we, we don't want to announce ahead of time. It, it only takes a second for people to put their phones up. And, oh, right. Yeah. Um, but, but the set list also changes from night to night. So whoever's writing the set list, they can choose whatever songs from the catalog that they, that they want to play that night and whatever new song that they feel like they want to work on. Um, you know, for myself, if, if there's a if there's a tune that I'm working out a groove, I'll put that song in, in my set every time until I get to the point where I, I feel, OK, that's that's where it needs to be now that can that can live for a minute. You know, yeah. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you guys own and operate your own record label, right? We so do. I assume the last year was focusing on keeping the business going. Was there any new ideas developed or I mean, how did you handle yeah, it? For sure. For sure. We started the record label in 2006. Um, and every record that we've released since then has been a learning process and we're continuing to continue to figure that out. Um, one thing that's changed about the business that I'm sure a lot of people know about is that vinyl is, is, uh, is a big part of, of what we do now anyway. And so we, as soon as the pandemic happened, we, we started to put in place some, some plans to release some vinyl that would help sort of, you know, tie us over. Um, fortunately we have a fan base that is, they are rabid and they, they are, they're willing to, to, to purchase whatever vinyl we put out there. Um, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's, you know, it's a physical thing. And, and uh, so many of our fans came up in the generation where you had at least a CD, if not mm -hmm. a cassette or, or a piece of vinyl. And, and this way you can, you know, you, you, you sort of, you listen to the music and you have some imagery there and some information where the record was recorded and, and some credits and that's all that stuff goes into sort of creating what, what ultimately your brain looks at as, as, as that, that record's world, you know, that, that, that place that you go when you put on whatever, whatever record you're listening to. And, um, so, so for us, vinyl is super important. Our, our fans very much are, are fans of vinyl and, uh, we were able to keep that end of the business going between that part and the streaming of, of the shows. We were able to stay afloat, thankfully. Now, what did you do as a drummer to keep inspired? Were you practicing regularly or again, was this a time to take a break and rest? Um, well, the, the, the first part of it was a little bit of a shit show. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, we were trying to figure stuff out. Um, I was always practicing, trying to keep up with stuff. Um, but you know, in, in September, I started actually taking lessons with Dom Famulero. Okay. And that was a groundbreaking experience for me. I, I so enjoyed it. Uh, I still see him uh, and I, I learned so much in the, in the past year. It really it helped me to be focused. Uh, I, I learned a lot about, about things that I never took the time to figure out, you know. Uh, when I when I was in my very very earliest stages of drumming, I I never really took time to even really think about how you hold the sticks and so much of what I what I learned I, I really taught myself. Um, and so going back to just learning the free stroke was for me it was amazing, and it kind of reminded me of of the Karate Kid where you do wax on wax off, <laughs> right? You know, because for months it was just me going bam. Bam, bam, you know, and I go see him yeah. again the next week and be like, yeah, it looks good. Move your wrist. And it looks warm. <laughs> so I'd sit there in front of the mirror and I would do that for hours, but I found it to be very meditative mm. and it helped me a lot staying focused. And, and when, when the news wasn't so good on, uh, you know, in the outside world, it was, it was really great to be able to, you know, wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee and go downstairs and open up stick control and look at page seven again. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the one-page book. <laughs> pretty much. So it, it that was that was great, and I, man, I'm I'm so fortunate to 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 have had time to to spend with him and, and learn some of these things, and hopefully, when we get back on the road, I'm going to be able to incorporate some of this stuff into my normal playing, and you know, again, maybe try to just play like a human being, not a mm. maniac. You know? So, what kit are you taking on the road this time? Um, probably some incarnation of the Gretsch kit that I've got back there right now. A little bit of a mismatch. I've got a 13-inch rack tom up there right now, 
and a 14 by, uh, 14 by 16 floor, Tom, and 14 by 24 uh, bass drum. Those are all Gretsch USA Customs. Mm. Um, so I'll probably play that kit or maybe uh, that kit actually has a 26 inch bass drum as well. Uh, I like to play quite a bit too. It really works well for live. So mm -hmm. it'll be it'll be one of those. I'm I'm always switching. You know, I, I, whatever drum I'm on at that time is the one that I think is like that's the one. That's the one I'm playing all along. You know, <laughs> what's the snare on that kit? Um, that is actually an Acrolyte. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an Acrolyte that I got in the '90s uh, when we were on tour with Marilyn Manson. Hmm. And it's one of the acrylites that has that sort of uh, black kind of. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, black galaxy. I think they called it. Yeah, um, it's a beautiful drum, and and I used it for years and years, and sort of put it away. And I've kind of rediscovered that drum in the last year. Um, so that drum's been seeing a lot of action these days. Are you going to take it on the road, or you got something else? I think I'll probably take. I'll take this guy on the road. Uh, the Gretsch 4160. Chrome mm. over breath. This is kind of my go-to live drum. Can do it can do most anything you want it to do. It sounds beefy. It sounds fat. I love the ring that it's got in it. Um, brass just kind of has a certain tonality that uh, I get along with. I, mm. I, I love brass drums a lot. And that one in particular is kind of my live live go-to drum do you take a spare yeah I, I do i'll take that one uh i'll take maybe i've got two of those uh one with the slightly wider uh snare wires on them and then okay. one with a little you know, um it's pretty it's wild how different that sounds you, know, so you just take two of the same drum with different wires yeah and when do you pick yeah. one or the other depending on the the venue yeah, depending on the venue or maybe whichever one has a fresher head at the mm. time, you know, kind of, again, it's sort of that thing, you know, you put a drum in front of me and I play it. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the, you know, don't change it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't think of you as, as an overly hard hitter anymore. Do you blow through heads or can you go a, no. a bit? No, I, I, I think you're right. I don't I don't hit as hard as I used to. I, I try to. uh um, you know, I just pay attention to the way I'm, I'm hitting the drums and I try not to stab them. Yeah. Uh, heads usually last uh, plenty, plenty long for me. Usually it'll be one of the techs will say, hey, can we change out these these Tom heads already? And I'll say, ah, tomorrow. Let's do it. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when's the last time you broke a head on a jinx show? When's the last time you broke a head on stage? Yeah, it, it's been a while, but I did I did break a bass drum head uh, probably within the last, uh, I don't know, four years. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I had one of those big ass Aquarian uh, patch pads. Oh, yeah. You know, it sat in the in the drum box for years. And one night, I think we were in Grand Rapids, you know, the the most terrible thing that can happen on <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah, that's like a big sticker, right? It's a big plastic dot sticker. Exactly. It's just a huge dot. And you put it on there and it just patches everything up. It doesn't sound particularly good. <laughs> but it will get you through the rest of the night without having to swap out a bass drum. And... Oh, man, that's a good tip. Anyone get yourself that. I can't remember what they call them, but you'll, you can find them. Aquarian Super Dot or Super Pat. I don't know what they're called. It's like a 12 inch or 10 inch dot, right? It's a pretty massive yeah. thing. Yeah, it's, it's it look it looks like a it looks like a one of those one of those patches that you put on your bass drum, but just freaking Giant. huge. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, I want to dig into drum sounds with you because yeah. I feel like you're one of the few drummers in the modern age that I that I feel can get a beautiful open drum sound, especially on the snare. Do you do any dampening on your snare? Usually none. So and what's the, the trick, dude? What's the trick? <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I think part of it maybe is is the tuning. I think um, I used to have a tendency to tune snare drums too high. I think. Okay. 
and I like that that ring in a drum. But I think when you tune it super high, there's there's this kind of frequency that just really stands out. And sometimes it can it can work. You know, I think about like uh, you know, like like Primus. You know, like Tim Herb Alexander. Like when when those records first came out. There was there was a really special kind of thing that the snare was doing. No one had heard that kind of thing, and, mm-hmm. and so I remember trying to get after that kind of sound, uh, and then learning pretty quickly that it doesn't always work. And at least in the in in our environment and the way that we make music and the in the tones that we're working with here. So I, I think maybe maybe the first step is just is not tuning quite so high. Um, and it also doesn't work if you go too low. If you get too low, then there's this like rumbly thing that kind of starts to happen, and that doesn't really work either. So, so, so maybe just a step below tight, you know. And what does that mean? Is that like when you think tight is what when the head's choked, and then you go? Yeah, yeah I, I guess so. I guess I guess just just south of that, you know. And you can and sometimes that choke sound is a cool sound too. I mean, I'm, you know, I like that kind of a sound also. But I, I think with 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 my band and the tones that we have, you gotta you gotta sort of pick where your frequencies are going to stick. Um, if I do other stuff with other other folks, you know, other other projects that I might that might work on, I'll I'll venture out of that. Maybe I'll go a little higher or a little lower. Um, but you know, and the, the sound that we make is really dense. It's so you know, Tim's playing through two Marshalls or two orange uh, at least half stacks. So there's, and then on the other side of the stage, there's an ampeg or two. So, I mean, there's, there's 800 watts of just guitar, you know, cutting through on stage. So you gotta, you gotta pick where, where you're going to be in that frequency range. And after 30 years, I'm, I'm close to figuring it out. So is that drum beside you tuned how you would use it? Can we get like a, a quick tap on it? Yeah. Yeah. So. You go out to the edge, it definitely has a lot more ring. Yeah, sounds like a snare drum. I think it's in your touch. Are well, you hitting mostly rim shots? Um, for back beats, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, although I will say that now that I've been working with Dom, my, my hands are stronger, and that's not always my go-to sound. Now, mm. Usually, you know, when I'm playing a, playing just a beat every every snare drum is a backbeat every every backbeat is a rim shot mm-hmm. um now that my hands are a little bit more i feel like they're a little stronger i can say what i want to say a little better that's not, not always my go-to thing now now is that um i, I think i've inter- interrupted you when you're talking about in the studio is it when do you put a little bit of dampening on or ever uh when the engineer says will you please put a little bit of dampening on? <laughs> And then, and then it's usually like half of a moon gel, like on the very edge of the drum. And then when the engineer's not looking, I might even move that to a little bit away. So I, I assume mic placement has to play a role in it. Like they're not leaning on the super close mic for you. I'm just trying to find the secret. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, th- I think you're right. I think a lot of it has to do with the room sounds, you know. Uh, and that, and those are the kind of sounds I like anyway. I like a, I like a sort of a roomier uh, sound where where it's, you don't feel like the snare drums like in your ear hole. You know, mm-hmm. you can, you got a, a more of a picture of the entire kit. And and I think when you do that, you can you can get away with with drums that are you know might have a little more funky kind of a ring in them or or um, you know bass drum heads. Um, these days I'm tuning them super low, like mm. like where they're just past where they where the wrinkles just come out and I just let that drum just do its thing hmm. and at the volume that we play uh much so much of that rumble kind of j- just goes away and you don't really hear that and instead you just get that sort of density that, 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 that those heads will give you hmm. so live um i assume you're not putting up room mics for your for your kit um is it yeah. Regular uh, overheads, four fourteens, mm-hmm. in, in you know your standard sort of places. Um, one thing that we have started doing live that that uh, is kind of new for us. Um, it's kind of a studio trick too, where you where you take a um, you know one of those EV um, like PA mics, you know the kind that they would have like in the school cafeteria, mm. you 
table one those are. But we'll put that uh, right between sort of the bass drum and the snare drum. And that's kind of a, a lot of studio guys will do that trick. But we started doing that live and just mixing that in a little bit. Um, because we keep the guitar cabinets in front of the drums, that microphone is really picking up mostly just drums, you know, bass drum, snare drum, mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we can mix that in and that, that just gives you a little bit of like a, a little bit more density. That's sort of almost like a syrupy kind of a sound where it just starts to glue things together. Mm. Do you do any muffling when you're touring on live? No, everything's, everything's wide open. Um, sometimes we'll have a, 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 a microphone inside the bass drum, like, uh, um, um, the the sure sm91 mm-hmm. or maybe the sennheiser version of that and we'll put that on a little towel inside the drum but even then um there's no no muffling on the on the resonant or batter head at all mm. yeah it's a great sound yeah i'm i'm, I'm jealous because every time i try to do that it's like nah it ain't working <laughs> end up going over muffling almost all the time <laughs> well you know it all so much of it has to do also with the places that you play, you know, I mean, there's, there's been, been plenty of times when I try to do that, that kind of a thing, um, at a blues gig, for example, and that, that does not work. You've got to, you've got to, you got to tighten it up a little bit. You know, it depends on the room that you're playing. And I think, mm. so, and what kind of mood you're in. um, do you remember the drums you used on all your, all the records? I remember remember a lot of them. Do you remember the snare on the self-titled record? Absolutely. What yeah. was it? I, I have that snare drum here. I'll go get it. It's one of That's my favorite. Sweet. <laughs> Oh wow, that's like an entry yeah. level aluminum. Yeah, Slingerland. Yep. So this this was um, this was a drum I picked up on the road uh, in 1994, shortly before we recorded the, the self titled record. Uh, we were on tour with Sepultura, hmm. and uh, that bill was Sepultura, Fear Factory, Fudge Tunnel, and Clutch. And nice. I can remember we were in Oklahoma City. And I went out with Dino from Fear Factory. We, we went out and we got some tacos that it was like a Taco John's or something like that. And across the street from Taco John's was a pawn shop. And I just walked in there. And at that point, I didn't really know a lot about old drums. Um, and I just saw that drum sitting there. It was 40 bucks. And I figured, how, how bad can it be? You know? <laughs> well, I got that drum and I, I played it that very night. Man, that drum has been on probably every record that we've made since then at least one song that's crazy did you have to replace any of the parts i know those throw-offs are a little squirrely uh no the the throw-off is is actually in excellent condition um the butt plate screws are not even stripped yet (laughs) and you know i definitely changed the heads a couple times but um even even the muffler you know, like a lot of times those, these things will rattle and stuff. This thing is great. It's and it's mint. super, tough, you know, if you do want to dampen something, you can just dampen it just a little bit. Such a great drum, super fun to play. And it's got kind of a, a unique, a unique thing about it. That's, it's, um, you know, it's not a real fat sounding drum. It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, kind of clanky sounding mm-hmm. and it, it has a way of sort of cutting through any mix. It's, Super, super fun to play. I, I love that drum. Yeah, I think that was Slingerland's answer to the Acrolyte. I could be wrong, but that was like their their student model aluminum drum. I could see that. I could see that because if you look at the construction of the drum itself, I mean it's it's just a it's a piece of aluminum that's just sort of bent together, and they have this sort of plate there that looks like it's holding it together. I mean, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't know how much it cost when it was brand new, but it couldn't have been very expensive. But, you know, it just goes to show you, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, to get a good sound out of, out of a drum. You know, if, I think if you just put some decent heads on there and you tune it to, to, to where you kind of get a sound out of it, at the end of the day, it's just how you're hitting the thing that's really, that's where the sound comes from. Mm-hmm. 
Are there any other snares that like have been on majority of your records? For sure, that was the that's the the one that that makes it on every record. Um, this drum here was a drum that I purchased in the late eighties. Is that a Tama? Yeah, that's a Tama. Piccolo. Piccolo bird's eye maple. What is it? Bird. Uh, it's maple. It's not bird's eye maple. Okay, maple piccolo. Not a drum yeah. I would think that you would be using, quite honestly. <laughs> well, you know, it, there were there were a couple drummers in the in the late '80s that, that were using these drums similar to this one. Um, two two drummers from completely different worlds, but I, at that time, I was a fan of them both, and I figured, well, if those guys can play a drum like that, I could certainly play one. And so the, the first guy was Matt Chamberlain. And I actually listened to the episode of the podcast with, with him on it uh, last week. Yeah, the Noble and Coley, right? <laughs> uh, I, w I was a fan of his big time when I, when I was a younger drummer, still am. I remember seeing him on Saturday Night Live with Edie Brickell. Yes. Yeah. Just knocked me out. You know, I, I was, you know, I was a metal guy. I was a hardcore guy. I liked rock and roll and ACDC and Black Sabbath and, you know, and I saw Edie Brickell on there. I was like, this is this is fantastic. I, I love the music. I love the drumming. And I can remember some of my friends made fun of me for liking that music. <laughs> you know, whatever, man. I, I like it. And so I'd play along to it. And um, so that, that snare drum stuck in my head. I thought, man, that'd be cool to have. And then, and then I went and saw Corrosion of Conformity. Mm. The old 930 Club. And that would have been in 1989, right? Or maybe a year after I saw Matt Chamberlain play a, a drum like that. And so here's Reed Mullen, one of my very favorite drummers of all time, uh, playing with COC. And he's got this little tiny pickle of snare drum. And I think he might have had like a, a pearl free floating version of that drum. And he had his tune kind of low. Hmm. So that it was, it had this sort of thick, fast sound and that just knocked me out i thought well certainly if if reed's playing a drum like that and matt chamberlain's playing a drum like that well I, i've got to have one certainly <laughs> so that, was, that was like my first real drum purchase you know that i, I was very proud of this drum because it was the first sort of quality instrument that i that i'd ever bought so which which records has it been on uh, this was on the very first record on, on our Pitchfork 7 inch, the very okay. first we ever did. And it's also the snare drum on, uh, on Animal Farm. Uh, and it's on uh, it's on one song on Pure Rock Fury, I think. And, um, it was uh, the Great Outdoors. Um, and then at some point, the, the, uh, the lugs on the, on the drum started to go bad where I would tighten it up and the, the lug would sort of like mash down into the drum. Mm. And so that it became very difficult to tune. So I retired the drum and I couldn't find any lugs that would, you know, that would, that would match this drum but in particular that would work. Uh, and then... You know, I think I might have been on on Drum Factory Direct. Yeah. Where I, you guys have the trick lugs over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I got them from you guys, and it just so happened that they were almost exactly like the Tama lugs. So I was happy to be able to get that drum back in action, and I've been playing that on and off since then. Nice. That you keep you tune it like a piccolo, or do you go low like Reed? Oh, no, not 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 super low. It's not as low as Reed Mullen had his, but. Yeah, that's 
sounds yeah. that sounds big. I would never have guessed that's a piccolo. I know, right? It, it, it doesn't. It's deceiving. When you look at it, you think it's going to sound a certain way. It's, it's an awesome drum. It, I, I love it. And I also think the fact that the wood has just been hanging around for 35, 40 years now, I think cool stuff just happens with wood. You know, it, it those molecules just kind of start hanging out in a way. If you play that drum a lot, I think everybody just starts talking to each other. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, 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 I think it makes a difference. What is the the latest snare that you've added to your collection, or do you add continually add? Uh, I definitely continually add. I, I have <laughs> embarrassing. Um, uh, I've started playing a uh, Gretsch um, solid steel shell, and I've got a that one is a five and a half, uh, five and a half by fourteen, and that's a great drum for for live because it's it's really loud um the shell is so heavy though i feel like it doesn't really want to play more softly uh it kind of does one thing really really well so in the right in the right situation that drum is definitely that's a go-to drum for sure but that's not one that i would necessarily play just like in my house when i'm just trying to pretend like I'm Art Blakey or something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's another one that you added recently? Uh, another, well, I've got some classic uh, Slingerland stuff too. Um, I found a um, five by 14. Uh, I think it's a mahogany shelled Slingerland, but it has the, the Mardi Gras wrap on it. Ooh, cool. And let me get that that's a cool looking drum too. Oh yeah, that's cool. Right, isn't it beautiful? Yeah, I love it. Is that uh, solid or is that a three ply? Crazy. <laughs> that throw off is nuts. Yeah, I'm not really. You know, to be honest, I haven't totally figured it out. I'm not really sure what we're supposed to do. <laughs> I know that the more I turn it, it, it definitely gets tighter. Uh, oh my god, looks yeah. like I should be pouring coffee out of that thing. <laughs> 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 right um, but it is beautiful i love i love the shape of the throw off yeah and this one's in pretty good shape too the, the other side here the the butt plate looks good um and everything still works on this drum that's what i like about it and i think the snares are original as well oh look at that yeah the extended throw off that goes over the edge yeah yeah well that would have been pretty state-of-the-art at the time I suppose. <laughs> yeah right now that doesn't seem like a drum that would hold up well to plan with the band. Is that one you just keep for your own practice? Yeah, that, that was, yeah. I, I I took that into the studio one time, thinking I could use it on a on a track, and I started to beat the crap out of it, and it just it did not want to do that. <laughs> it's not it, those drums. I feel like are they're awesome, but you can't you can't slam that thing and get you know get one of those big backbeats consistently out of it. It just, it seems to be crying for mercy the whole time. Like, please stop hitting me so hard. <laughs> yeah. Get some brushes. <laughs> so where are you going to record the, the, the new stuff? Uh, we're going to record, uh, in Baltimore at the magpie cage. Oh yeah. Great uh, room. It is a good room. Have you, have you recorded there before? I have. I used, I used his, um, Yamaha kit and it sounded beautiful in there. That blue one. Yeah, the Manu Kache Yamaha kit. <laughs> yeah, that's a great kit. I've played that one myself. <laughs> yeah, we're looking forward to that. That we'll we'll, uh, we'll be there in the fall. Um, we're bringing in a um, a producer this time as well, a guy named Tom Delgetti. Um, we actually just spent uh, a week in pre production with Tom, and that was great. Uh, so Tom will be producing, and Jay Robbins will be engineering. Um, we're going to, it's going to, it's going to be great. Jay, Jay is so much fun to work with. Uh, and he's so in tune with that room. He knows exactly where, what the microphones are going to sound like, depending on where you put them. And there's a lot of options too in that, in that room. It's a, it's a beautiful space. So what is, what was pre-production? Did he come to your rehearsal spot there? Yeah, we were right here. Um, he actually sat where I am right now. I moved my drums across to the other side of the room because I didn't want to blow Tom's ears out with my drums that are usually right here. Um, yeah, it, it was great. We, we had uh, 13 songs 
And when we finished the week, we had 14. So I think we had a pretty good week. That's wild. No cuts. I would think a producer, yeah. the first thing they do is trim the fat. Yeah, not, not yet. Not yet. The, uh, that'll, that's probably will still happen at, mm. at some point. So for you guys, how does that work with, when you bring in an outside producer? Because you have your thing. I mean, what is, what is the producer's role with Clutch? Uh, he tells us what to play. <laughs> we are so used to having that that interaction with the audience like like we were describing before where where you know we write a song and then we take it to the stage and the, the stage is the testing ground and we know after, after we played that song one two three times we know just where that song is going to be and what parts of it's been totally different this year because we haven't had that 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 interaction um we find it's like swimming in a fishbowl here, mm-hmm. uh, and and so we're we're trying out ideas and then asking each other a lot. Well, I don't know. What do you think of that? I, I don't know. What, what do you think? And after being together for thirty years, it, it's it's difficult sometimes. You know, it, it as much as we try to change, as as much as we try to evolve or try trying to do into some some new stuff. It's still the same four dudes who've been playing the same instruments for 30 years. Mm. So it's hard not to repeat yourself. Um, but we make a, we make an effort of it. And, and, and so we, we worked hard before Tom got here. And we had 13 things that we thought were, were pretty. Were, there were solid song ideas that were unique to this record. Um, and then we just start playing the tunes with him. And, it, and, and right away... He'll just suggest things. Sometimes it's just just small tweaks. I can remember specifically, um, I w- we were working on a chorus for one of the tunes, and I'm f- trying to figure out wh- where to put my bass drum notes. You know, the, the detail of, of the stuff. You know, it's like it's like okay, yeah, I, I know this. I know this is going to be a shuffle. You know, I know that's the feel. But specifically, where are we going to put the bass drum notes? Where 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 are the accents, or what accents do I want to hit? You know. So I, I started, I had a conversation with Tom. Hey, Tom, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what to do here. I want to put a bass drum note here and another one here and, you know, maybe one over here. And he listened back a couple times and he said, you know what, just play less. You don't have to put all those bass drum notes in there. And I, and I think that kind of mentality is something that happens when the four of us are here just sort of like swimming around in the fishbowl. You're not really sure. And you're trying to, you know, sometimes you lose a, a sight of what, what the essence of the tune is, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so he helped a lot with that, sort of just simplifying things sometimes and, 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 and sometimes just suggesting things that we wouldn't even consider, you know? So just simple things like, well, that part was a cool bridge. Why don't you just use some of that as an intro? Like, oh, mm. well, yeah, great idea. <laughs> and the riff is sitting there in front of us, you know, like, we could have thought of that. <laughs> So, so it's 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 simple stuff that that I think in the end helps us. It gives us some sort of perspective on on what's going on because it's um, as I said, it's it's a little difficult not having that 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 live stage feedback that, that we are you know, we've been doing this for so long. It really is it, we depend on, on that. Mm-hmm. Are you recording the pre production the whole time or is it is it not? Yeah. This this room is mic'd up all the time. I've got I've got Mike Priest set up over here, and we've got the drums always mic'd up. There's a couple guitar amps here. We got mics on those. We have a DI box, and then we've got uh, a vocal mic here. Uh, half of it goes to the PA, and the other signal goes to directly into the computer. So at any time, whenever there's an idea, it's just a matter of pushing record. Hmm. And that's that's super helpful. We we've had this this type of a system for many years now and it's helped us document ideas immediately you don't have to we don't talk about it too much if somebody's got a riff we figure it out and boom start start recording right away um and a lot of times too i'm i'll i'll find a tempo on on whatever that idea is and immediately start working off of the tempo um because i, I think we've all been in situations where you know somebody will bring an idea to the room and you start jamming it and like, oh, man, this is the greatest idea 
deeper and it feels good and everybody's vibe and you can tell the energy's right. And then you go and you say, oh, let's record that. So you, you push record and you go back and then that energy's not there anymore. It, it went away. And I think there's a lot of ways that that energy can go away. There's a lot of things that people can do a little differently. But but one of the ways we can we can sort of keep that initial idea intact is to find that tempo and right mm -hmm. away, like, okay, this is where the tempo was. And, and this way we have a, uh, a, a we, it's, it's not somebody speculating like, oh, I think we played it faster last time. Or I think we, you know, I, I think when we get to the course, it slowed down a little bit. Now there's a tempo and now we can have a real conversation about it. Hmm. Uh, Want to speed that part up or slow it down. Um, and so right away you, you, you have a reference and that's, that is for us, that's been a super, super helpful writing tool. Do you keep a, like a metronome right by you or how do you do it? Doing the computer? Uh, this, it's as soon as these guys start riffing, I start tapping on my phone, click, hmm. click, click. And I find that tempo and then I'll, I'll open up the session and, and immediately put that tempo into the computer. So the click track is running and I, I sometimes I don't always play to the click track, but I always have that there as a reference. Mm -hmm. And when we go to lay the idea down, put on my headphones, we'll cut it to a click. And then sometimes we'll say, all right, well, we need a verse. So we'll just, we just, we can abandon those parts altogether. We don't have to remember them. They're in the computer. Let's come up with something completely different. And we have a tempo there to work off of. And, and, and that way you can start building things and you, you don't have to keep like this sort of laundry list of like the tempo was this and the course was this and blah, blah, blah. It's all, it's all in there, you know? Do you guys like simultaneously work on a bunch of stuff? Like you get an idea, document it, move on, or do you try to get a song kind of the core shape of a yeah. song before you move on? No, we, 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 we come up with an idea, uh, record it and then put it down. I'll, I'll, I'll show you something here. That's probably a, a little, you're going to think we're maniacs, but <laughs> this, is, this is kind of the way we do it. So, Oh shoot. Okay. So, so it goes all, you can see that it goes all the way back. We put a date next to everything there. It goes all the way back to uh, the first thing was one twelve that we were calling that, but, 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 but Donna wanna. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> In the early stages. I'll even put, I'll even put a tempo down, you know, Does and I you say can fat Lizzie. Does that second one say fat Lizzie? Yes, that's Fat Lizzie. <laughs> can you imagine how we came up with that name. <laughs> and so we, and so we keep going. We bring the list gets going, and sometimes we readdress things. Sometimes I write stuff out for the guys, like, "Hey, let's hit this rhythm here." That you know, make these accents, and they look at me like I'm nuts. But, but. <laughs> and, then, and then it just keeps going. So we, then we start again over here. And, and so we just write down everything that we do each time, four, six, four, nine, four, 15, five, four. And then the li you can't see it. The list goes all the way down to the ground. But this, but this way we have, we, we can, we can look at, at all these parts. And, and sometimes we'll be like, well, you know, like, uh, you know, two, eight dark doom. Most of that was pretty lame, but there was, um, there was a, there was a bridge and uh, there was a bridge in there that was, was kind of cool and that tempo was kind of similar to uh the fourth intensity so we put those together and mm. start mashing those up so a lot of these aren't even really songs they're just sort of building blocks that we start putting together in different orders and so it, it becomes sort of incestuous and cannibal like at times are there vocals happening during this whole time or is it riff writing yeah, um yeah a lot of times there's vocals it usually starts with a riff but as soon as that's happening, Neil starts right away saying Donna Wana or, or, or whatever, <laughs> you know, a, a sound, you know, like this will be a verse. He'll make a verse kind of a sound. And this is what we have. We have an idea. Okay, well, let's start molding that into a verse. You know, the vocal might be something like that. You know, these days, the vocal is key for me. That, that tells me what to play now. Mm -hmm. uh, I listen to Neil's rhythms and... Um, the, the pitches he's trying to hit and 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 I and I think to myself what 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 of that what part of that line do I want to accent or you know uh, uh, highlight uh, maybe I just want to play a beat under it maybe I don't want to play anything under it but you know it took us a while to figure it out but everybody in in the audience is a singer you know and by that I mean you know there there's a certain percentage of the people who come to the shows that are drummers and a certain percentage that are bass players. Um, 
But man, I, I think probably most everybody out in the crowd sings, whether it's in the shower or on your way to work or if you're cutting the grass or whatever, you know, everybody wants to, everybody wants to be, be a singer. And so for that reason, the, the vocal is super important, you know, and a lot of times I think that gets, that gets left behind in, in the kind of music that we do. The vocal, I think, takes, takes a back seat to the riffing. Mm-hmm. And certainly the riffing is important, but man, the vocal, the vocal is what everybody's going to latch on to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think about that all the time. How, how do I support that vocal? How do I make that, that vocal make the, the, the biggest impact that it can possibly make? Because Neil's words are important. And, and, and the way he sings is important. Um, the stuff that he sings about is important. And so I, I, I want to do my best to support that. Mm-hmm. When you guys take this over to Magpie to do the masters, um, do you try to maintain that live feel? You're all set up in the room together or do you go for more for isolated takes? Um, this time around, we, we will more likely than not be in the room together, all playing together trying to get a, a full performance of the song. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done both ways. You know, we, we, on some of our records we've done with machine, it's been, it's been very, I, I recorded drum tracks just by myself and, and, and whatever scratch tracks that we were listening to at the time, you know, where no one was, was in the room. Uh, and then we've done stuff on the other end of the spectrum where it's just completely live, no clicks, straight to tape, you know, uh, I, I don't think one way is, is better than another. It's just, a different way to to get to the end goal. Mm. Uh, I think this time around we'll probably be doing live performances. Everybody in the in the room together. Um, we'll more likely than not record the song two, three times, maybe, maybe four or five, depending on how much I know the song. <laughs> but at, at some point we'll get a hopefully we'll, we will get a uh, a performance that's. It's pretty good, you know, that, that we feel good about. And there might be just little bits, you know, maybe there's uh, maybe there's a fill that kind of sucked. And so maybe we'll pull something from somewhere else. Um, on occasion, I will I will cut a, a, a part specifically for that. You know, maybe there's a transition that I could do better. And so I might I might do that on my own. Uh, but but I, I think probably, you know, 90 percent of what you hear on the on the final recording will will be just us playing in the room together Mm. do um do you do percussion overdubs much um i i do sometimes i i kind of suck at percussion (laughs) it's not easy man it's it's, no no a tambourine for three minutes forget about it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, whenever we need percussion uh i call mike dylan my buddy mike and he Man, he'll drive his van from Kansas City just to come out and and mm. and do a percussion uh, session with us. So he's 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 amazing. He's I'm I'm fortunate to have him as a friend and a mentor and an inspiration. He's man, he's great. Uh, and we've had him out with us on the road from time to time. Um, he's one of the few people out there who uh, knows about DC Go Go, uh, mm. even though he's not from Washington DC. He's very well versed in the style. And I think you and I have spoken before, you know, Gogo has a lot to do with with the sound that we make. And I, mm. probably a lot of people don't realize that. But um, Mike does. And he's man, he's he's great. Um, what was I going to ask? Oh, what what gear are you going to take to the studio? Probably. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you take like multiple kits just to have uh, options? I'll take I'll take a couple bass drums. Um, you know, when we were doing pre-production last week, uh, I was auditioning bass drums all, all week long, and and some of them were I had two twenty-four inch bass drums. Um, heads were pretty much the same, with the exception that this one has a hole in the in the resonant head, so we stuck a microphone inside the drum. Uh, Usually I don't, I don't do that. Usually it's, it's, um, no holes in the bass drum. I have just an internal mic of some kind. And then, uh, the RE 20 on the resonant head, it's just pretty much as tuned as low as it'll go. You know, mm. it's kind of flopping around there. Um, but last week when, when we had Tom in town, we, we, um, we experimented a little bit. And so we tried some different things. I actually have a pinstripe head on, on this bass drum now. And I have, man, I haven't played a pinstripe head in 
30 years, I think. Yeah, I would say for me, it's a 90s for sure. Yeah. That was the sound. <laughs> um, but it, it, it worked. It kind, of, it kind of does a thing, you know. It, it, so I have a feeling I'll, I'll probably take this bass drum in. I'll definitely take the 26 in. Um, that one is just, you know, it's uh, coated. Or no, it's actually um, smooth white on the resonant side and then a coated emperor on the batter side tuned as low as it'll go no muffling mm -hmm. sounds so good um well last question we're getting to the end of the hour um what was your first snare drum my first snare drum was an acrolyte and i i i didn't realize what a great drum it was until it was gone mm. did you sell it or did you just get I rid did. of it I, I sold it Frankenstein kid as my first kid it was um was a Gretsch 22 inch concert bass drum. By that I mean no front head. Mm. Uh, I had a 13 inch concert tom. And then I had a Ludwig classic 13 inch concert tom and a 16 inch floor tom that had both both uh, heads on it. And looking back on it, those, those were great sounding drums. I, I wish I'd never sold that kid. Uh, that kit came with an acrylite drum as well. And I played those drums for a couple years and then I sold them and got a Tama swing star kit. And of course it was double bass and I had like four black toms. And <laughs> what color? <laughs> wine red. Ah, you got the wine red. That was the one I <laughs> wanted. <laughs> I got the Ferrari red. That's all they had available. Damn it. <laughs> Did you go to uh, Benham and Music to pick to get your kit? Uh, then oh. no, it was Making Music, Frederick. Oh, Making Music. All yeah. right. <laughs> you know, I was just there the other day. They're, they're, I love those guys, man. I, I love a good local music store. I know, right? It's like, that's one thing I miss. I used to go there and just hang out the counter. I mean, that's like the old cliche, but I literally would just hang out the counter. Just look at stuff. <laughs> so after the Acrolyte, was it the Piccolo? Yeah. After the Acrolyte, after the Acrolyte, I, I played the, the snare drum that came with the, with the Swing Star kit. Oh, right. And that was not a particularly good sounding drum. Sounds like a six and a half steel, probably. That was the one, and it just kind of went bonk, bonk, bonk. <laughs> no matter what you did with it, no matter how tight you made it. And so then I did all the stupid stuff. I put styrofoam inside of it and like 10 pieces of gaff tape, and, you know, foam <laughs> and whatever else. You know how you do like when you're a kid. Um, and I did the same thing for the Tom Toms too. I put all the kinds of stuff inside the drum. Because, you know, I, at the time, I didn't understand, you know, like I, I would sit at my drums and I'd play them. And I'd be like, this doesn't sound like a record, man. This didn't, mm -hmm. you know, this doesn't like, this doesn't sound like the Cro-Mags. You know, how do I get that sound? You know, and so immediately I start dampening everything up. And, you know, it takes a while before you realize, no, dummy, that's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. Yes, over. I mean, yeah. The day I got my kit, I put tea towels over the toms. Like I just did it. I like I got to. Right? Like... <laughs> and my uncle was like, "You got to tape strips of of towel, like bath towel, underneath the head." I'm like, "Really? Okay, I'll do it. Whatever, man. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever makes me sound like Kiss." <laughs> it goes, it goes do, do, do. <laughs> yeah. Sweet, man. Well, I appreciate you sitting down for the hour. This is super fun. Hope we can do it again. Um, and if you're in the Pittsburgh area on this run or the next run, hopefully we can hang and do something live in person. Um, I love that. But I appreciate you sitting down. It's always fun. I feel like this is a, a I made this podcast to be a safe space for us to just be nerds. And I'm glad you're willing to play play ball. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I, I, I'll talk drums all day long and I'm a fan of the podcast. I can't, I can't wait to the next episode that comes out and thank you for everything you do thank you jp so i'll uh, i'll talk to you soon sounds great man have a good one thanks all right i hope you enjoyed that episode please if you like this show drop a review over on itunes or wherever else you get your podcast that helps spread the word about the show and um, also you can email me your suggestions mike at drumfactorydirect.com or any questions 
Um, and then next week, I'm sitting down with another one of my favorite drummers slash producers, Aaron Steele. So see you next week. Mm-hmm.